Well, Rob Cosman is a master woodworker, and he's most well known for his hand tool woodworking. He sells and makes these tools. He teaches classes, and he's done this for decades. And he's joining us. He talks a lot about his career, which I found really interesting. The way that um, this, the way it's unrolled for him, and I'll let you hear it from him. And then we're talking about his Purple Heart Project, where he is teaching classes and really, uh, how do you say, sponsoring and giving away. Um, woodworking tools and an experience for wounded vets to come to his shop and it is completely changing their lives and it's really important. I don't know if anybody else is doing this and I think Rob's saving lives. So if you know people who are veterans or, or you're plugged into that community all at all, I really hope you listen to this because you might know someone you can refer his way. Um, if you enjoy woodworking, now I don't do woodworking, but wow, do I respect it. And Rob is the epitome of that. It's just the most elegant and timeless and classic, uh, type of craft known to man. And he really embodies that intelligent and perfectionist sort of a mindset of a master woodworking uh, craftsman. So I hope you enjoy it. He has a lot of content online. So after you listen to this, go check out some of his videos. If you need to learn to cut a dovetail, I don't know if there's a better teacher on planet earth. Without further ado, Rob Cosman. First of all, thanks for taking the time and for my own information also i didn't you probably have it in a video somewhere but i'd love to hear the story of how you got into uh hand tool woodworking and how your business kind of developed yeah. and such because um like i said i haven't come across that one yet well i just had my 60th birthday so if you go back 60 years my father was uh, went through teachers college to be a shop teacher Moved from New Brunswick, where we live, to Montreal to teach. Didn't last very long. Wasn't enough of a challenge. So I left Montreal when I was about a year and a half and moved back to New Brunswick. And he started his business as a carpenter contractor. And that was in a time when uh, you might not have electric power on job site for a month. So I remember going with him. This would have been preschool days. And uh, the, lumber, the lumber truck would show up and they would dump a bunch of what they would call pond green or pond dry, which meant one board might weigh 20 pounds heavier than the other simply <laughs> because they were soaking wet. There was no kiln dry. Huh. And there was nothing, there was uh, they were all random length. And I remember watching the carpenter working with them, would line all these boards up, flush up one end, measure up, chalk a line, and start with a handsaw and spend however long it took to cut across this six foot, seven foot, long stretch of two by four to get your studs and uh, i was fascinated with wood from the very beginning i it goes back to the actual earliest childhood memories i was building stuff that i would call complicated <laughs> i built a boat that actually floated when i was seven i uh, i built a set of hand grip walnut hand grips so it's also a gun nut born in the wrong country <laughs> and i had a a, a crossman peacemaker uh, pellet pistol that had came with plastic grips. Huh. Is there a bigger sin? <laughs> so my grandfather, who worked as a custodian in a school that had a shop, managed to find me two pieces of walnut, half inch thick. And I cut them all out. My father, always, we always had tools and wood around the, the basement. That's where I lived. And I cut these out. First, first pair did not fit. I shaped them all. And I, I just remember having a crying fit because my father said, they're good enough. You don't need any more walnut. And he was going around the room, pointing out the trim on the TV. Look at that. That doesn't fit. Do you think I'm worrying about that? <laughs> remember my father, my mother's comment, Glenn, he's a perfectionist. Leave him alone. Wow. So I ended up getting another pair of wall, another piece of set of walnut pieces, made the second grips. They fit. I have them today. And I hope that doesn't sound like I'm boasting, but if I were to go into the shop today and make a set of grips for that walnut, uh, walnut grips for that pistol, they wouldn't look any different than those ones did when I was, I think, 11. So it's that, been in the blood. My grandfather was a carpenter. I worked with my grandfather. My great grandfather was a carpenter. My father was a carpenter. Um, move that, jump that ahead. I did all my teenage years, I spent a lot of time in the shop building stuff. 
And I actually grew up, uh, my father had a shopsmith, one of the early ones, probably the most dangerous, dangerous setup for a table saw that was ever invented. And I'm surprised I still have all my fingers and my limbs. I remember ripping long boards on a radial arm saw, turned sideways, probably the most dangerous operation there is. Wow. And I built stuff on this stuff. Also learned, learned what tools I was never going to buy myself. So um, I uh, spent two years as a missionary, came back, went off to Brigham Young University. Actually went there to study physiotherapy, but uh, found it real quick. I didn't want to do that. Aimlessly walking through campus, wondering, what well, now what am I going to do for a year? And I stumbled across a wood shop that they had where students could go in and rent time. And I thought, oh, wow, this is neat. Then I found out that BYU actually had a woodworking program, which I couldn't fathom why they would. Ended up meeting Dale Nish. Dale was a Canadian who was in charge of the woodworking program. They actually, what they did is they taught woodshop teachers. So um, I took a class from him, an advanced class. He put me in. And uh, at the end of the year, I wasn't planning on coming back. And he said to me, uh, he said, well, he said, I'll tell you something. He said, you've got the best hands and the best speed that I've had in all my years of teaching. You decide to come back. I'll hire you as my assistant and I'll get you a scholarship. Well, I'd had enough of that place. I didn't want any more. Went home, went to work for a year building log homes with my father and found out not every father and son can work together. <laughs> we weren't made to work together. Yeah. And um, ended up, you know, Getting married, uh, I had known my wife since she was two or younger. Our fathers were business partners. We were neighbors. Huh. I'd gone away for two years, and she grew up. So when I came back, <laughs> we got married in the summer of 1985. I called Dale Nish up, and he said, yep, the offer still stands. So off we went. Spent four and a half, almost five years at BYU studying furniture design. Got to work under a man named Milo Boffman, who is a, was, would be one of the premier furniture designers in the United States. If you're not in that field, you wouldn't know the name, but anybody in it would. He also hired me to do his prototype work. So I got lots of lots of fantastic experience and work. I literally lived in the uh, shop. It was 190 of the Snell building, and I had the keys so I could go in anytime I wanted, and I was there all the time. My wife used to come drag me away. Anyway, uh, the summer of 1987, I got hired to work as an assistant at Anderson Ranch Arts Center in Aspen, Colorado, actually in Snowmass Village. And there I got to work as an assistant to Sam Maloof, Tay Frid, Alan Peters, Peter Korn, Silas Kaufman, Roe Robinson. If you don't know those names, if you were to open up a fine woodworking magazine from that era, I just listed the guys who were writing all the articles. And it was, it was, I, I learned more. I shouldn't say, uh, yeah, I did. I learned more and had more of a focus driven experience um, what I wanted to do in those four months than I did in four years of university. My um, my second year, I was teaching. My second year, they're all dead, so I can say this without fear of having them hear it. But by my second year, I knew more and could do more with hand tools than any of the instructors. So I was teaching the class. And uh, Dale Nish had once said to me, he said, Rob, he said, you, you cover your plane ticket and I'll cover all the other expenses. So he would drag me all over the country and introduce me to uh, all of these, you know, uh, well-known woodworkers. And as a result of that, um, that all paid huge dividend down the road. I also got to meet uh, Paul Bertarelli, who was at the time was the editor of Fine Woodwork Magazine. So I wrote my first article way back then. Came back, moved home to New Brunswick in 1989, started my furniture business. Had tons of work for the first two years because everyone that knows you want, has something for you to do. I, I should have paid closer attention to my business classes because uh, you gotta you gotta have some money left over at the end of every job. So I uh, was building my family at the same time I was building my business. We came home and had our second child a month or so after we arrived home, and then uh, we went on to have ten children eventually. But by the time we had five. I couldn't, I couldn't feed them. I, there weren't enough hours in the day. I used to work from Monday morning until midnight on Saturday night when I would stop work. And uh, you just could not. You couldn't find the uh, customers. You couldn't design it. You couldn't procure the materials, build it, deliver it, and actually have any money left over at the end of the day. 
Plus, there was always the mental thing, too, that uh, I can't lose this job, so I have to price it yeah. at a price I know they'll take, which was usually less than the material bill. So <laughs> people call and ask me, tell me they want to get into woodworking business. Would I have any advice? And they said, yes, marry wealth. <laughs> um, so that went through, and, t- I, and we were doing all kinds of other things, trying to keep my furniture business alive. I was selling graduation rings. I was selling new skin products. I was doing everything just to keep this business. I did not want it to fail. Well, in uh, late 1999, I was down to uh, $75 at one point. And I just thought, this we can't continue this. Is, or I'm going to starve all these people. I also, at that time, had this epiphany that the only people who appreciated what I was doing didn't want to buy it. They wanted to learn how to build it. And at the same time, I got an email from a guy named Tom Lee Nelson. I had no idea who the man was. But I had been selling woodworking magazines. Dale Nish tried to hook me up, um, give me some extra work. So I was selling woodworking magazines in North America for a British publisher, GMC. Problem was, Americans would pick up a magazine that had this funny-looking pound symbol on it. And this uh, too foreign. Yeah. So uh, fortunately... Uh, the folks in England knew me. Tom happened to be doing a wood show over there and had shared a booth or was a, at a booth right beside them. He was lamenting to them about how he could ship tools to Japan so much easier than he could to uh, Canada, his next door neighbor. And they drew the connection and said, Hey, we got a guy in your neighborhood that'd probably do a good job for you. So Tom emailed me, asked me if I'd be interested in selling his tools in Canada. Like I said, I didn't know him. Took a drive down there. It was only about three hours away. Thoroughly impressed with what I saw because he was selling tools in a state of readiness that I had been taught to get my tools. Mm. So um, on a handshake, I said, yep. And I was thinking, okay, this might be part-time. That nobody's going to buy. Nobody in Canada is going to spend this kind of money. But I wanted it. <laughs> within, uh, within a week, at the time, the most expensive plane they had was a number seven. And it was over $700 US, uh, Canadian when you converted it. And I'd sold four or five of them just telling people about it. A, a month later, I was doing it full time and we were on our way. All right. Now kick into the chapter two. It was a long time getting through chapter one. <laughs> um, I started doing the woodworking show circuit. And uh, I was, I, uh, I, had, I had had an affinity for hand tools my entire life because I always felt that a power tool did all the work. I mean, you set a thickness planer for three quarters of an inch and put a board in, leave the room, come back an hour later, you got a three quarter inch board on the other end. Yeah. I appreciate the speed and the accuracy, but take a rough board and process it with hand tools to make it three quarter. You stand back and look at that. That represents your skill. Yeah. And th- that just appealed to me. The feel, the touch, the smell, everything about handling the wood and not wanting to give it up to uh, a machine. Well, as I went out on the wood show circuit and uh, I was demonstrating, there was nobody demonstrating dovetails and I was Mr. Dovetail. So I would get this huge audience and it would literally suck the room dry. (laughs) Neighbors didn't really like it because I'd be there in a 10 foot booth and my audience would be eclipsing the booth on both sides of me. So nobody ever wanted to be beside Cosmo. Yeah. Uh, What can I do, right? Tell them all to leave. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, the people, we would sell, we would sell tons of tools but I'd run into somebody at the next show and I'd say, how are you doing with that dovetail saw? Well, you know, by the time I got home and got down into the shop, dang it, I couldn't remember everything you did, meaning they hadn't used it. Yeah. I said, well, this is a go nowhere situation. So somebody at some point said, Rob, you should do a video on making dovetails. I never even thought about it, but I looked into it, went out on a limb. I spent more money producing that first video than I made my last year of woodworking, which is 1999. Wow. And uh, I have to throw this in. A little nervous. It was about a week before it was ready to be released. And I called up a friend of mine, Rex Birmingham, who was uh, worked at, for Craft Supplies at the time. And Craft Supplies was Dale Nish's son's business. And that was probably the largest wood, uh, wood turning supply company in the world. And he, call, I, he, he called me or I called him and he said, Cause he says, I thought I ought to tell you. The best video we have, we only sell about 50, 60 copies a year. Oh, I got this pit in my stomach. Yeah. Truth be known, I took the money that I owed Lee Nielsen for the last batch of tools and spent it producing this video. 
Wow. So I was, I didn't sleep well that week. <laughs> Good news is we released the video and within 10 days we had it paid for. Well, how did you release it? What, where was the release? Like to, to um, a magazine or a show or what, what did release look like? Uh, that was, that would have been in 2000. So that we wouldn't have had much of an email following at all. So we did it, I guess, through the wood shows. I, uh, I, you know, Lee Nelson bought a bunch of them. And there were people, I think, that had just given me their names and phone numbers and said, you know, as soon as it's ready, I want a copy. Yeah. I, I, that's a good question because, I, I mean, there was, there was email back then, but I, don't, I really don't remember. I just remember they flew out the door. Yeah. And, well, I guess uh, the, the answer to the question is back then, they probably came in a, on a pallet and like, you know, they were DVDs, not, unlike today where really, it's all digital. Well, what were they? Oh, VHS. geez. Okay. Yeah, so so it was probably not a lot different than selling a lot of products where it's like, these are the products. Let's sell them instead of today, everything you think about distribution for video in terms of the internet. And oh, yeah. Oh, no. This is so it was selling products. Big, big bulky, big, bulky. I, I remember the shipment. You had to order a minimum of 1,000 at a time. So we had, uh, and they came 30. I, I can't, actually, I can't remember how many you can even get in the box, but I just remember loading up the garage. But so the good you, news you sold is them? they sold. And uh, that next year, we did another one, and it got, grew to a point where that was our bread and butter. Um, very profitable, that particular product. Anyway, I, uh, as soon as you release that, all of a sudden you start getting people wanting you to come teach, come speak, whatever. So Rob, uh, Rob Demart, who ran a woodworking program in Sher at Sheridan College in Oakville, Ontario, contacted me or saw me at a show and asked me if I'd be interested in, in teaching a, a week-long class on hand tools. So I put together the curriculum. We called it Training the Hand which is now what we do with the combat wounded vets. But I started teaching that four, three or four times a year and filled the classes. Um, I got a ton of experience with people buying the tools. I have to tell you this. So the, Canada's a big country. And I used to do the Witch Show Circuit from Halifax, which is on the far east coast, to Victoria, which is on the far west coast. And we would, we would start in late September, and you would do a different show every weekend. Well, you set up on Thursday, the show went Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you tore down Sunday night, you would travel to the next show and start all over. Well, I couldn't afford, I was operating, even though I was representing Lee Nelson, I bought wholesale, sold retail, I had my own expenses. So I couldn't afford to fly to Victoria, do a woodworking show, fly home Sunday night, get home sometime Monday, and turn around and fly back out to Vancouver Wednesday night in order to get there to set up on Thursday. So I would stay there. And Camosun College has a woodworking program that they don't use Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night. So I would rent that and I would have guys come in that had bought tools from me on the weekend and I would teach them dovetails or sharpening and hand planing and whatever. But I had a whole lot of firsthand experience watching my average 55, 60 year old customer using these the Nelson tools. If you live in Canada and you're that age, you got a bit of arthritis. <laughs> Plus you're not in the best shape of your life. The eyesight's diminishing. You don't have the mobility you once had. And these guys would be trying to manipulate little adjustment screws on a Lee Nelson tool, and they just was, they couldn't do it. And I would go back, and I'd tell him, I said, look, you got to change this. Well, he wasn't interested in changing his tools. And it was a real sticking point because if I'm there to teach you how to do something, but you can't operate the tool because this little thing's in the way. Yeah. So we used to set up, quick example, the, the block plane. The minute you would release the spin, the uh, – the uh, big wheel on, underneath the lever cap that holds it all tight. You had to loosen it just enough so you could make adjustments. But the way it was made, if you tipped it at all, all the parts would fall on the floor. And of course, when you're teaching people brand new, they're all fine. <laughs> so we would get into a we'd, we'd get into a shop. We'd set up the drill press with a countersink bit and said, if you have this, 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 or this tool, come over and see me. And I'd cut a little chamfer on the lever cap so that the screw that holds it in place, you could loosen it, but it wouldn't fall apart. Mm -hmm. simple solution anyway we went on like that until 2008 and we finally parted company um i had i was demonstrating sometimes usually three weekends a month i was all over the canada united states and england those are the three countries that i did this in and i had gained a reputation for being really good at hand tools I had also made or modified a lot of my tools and the audience was forever coming up to serious buns and saying, well, Rob, I'd really like to have one of those. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not getting that. That's mine. 
<laughs> and then I realized, okay, so there's a market for this. Uh, we parted ways with Lee Nelson in January of 2008. I went uh, out to see Mike Wensloff in Oregon to see if he could make my saw because I'd come up with this idea. We, I used to sell thousands of Lee Nelson saws, thousands. And about 60% of the people that bought that saw could never use it accurately because they couldn't get it to start right on that line. As they went to push, it would jump. Had big teeth. Big teeth are, are essential because you want it to cut fast. But there's a trade-off. Big yeah. teeth that cut fast are hard to start. Little teeth that cut slow are easy to start. So I had this idea of taking a saw, making it a little bit longer, and then using the first two inches with little tiny teeth with a negative cutting face so that you could go in there and you could start a little curve just deep enough to catch your thumbnail in. Yeah. But enough to hold the saw blade in position so that as you move forward and those big fast cutting teeth engaged, they didn't slide left or right. And it was a hit. But I used a composite handle. That's a long story. But composite handle just happened to be the best solution for the problem. But I went through years of plastic handle crap being constantly harassed on the internet. And we didn't sell very many, but I stuck with it. And uh, we finally... You know, a few people, Chris Schwartz did a review and gave me a whole one-page review on, in Popular Woodwork Magazine. That helped. And David uh, Savage, which who's passed, well-known hand tool craftsman in England, did a review on dovetail saws. And even though he made fun of my handle in the article, he said, if I was going out to buy a new dovetail saw today, that's the one I would buy. And my saw was almost double the price of any of the other ones that were being reviewed. So... You have a few people speak up and they weren't speaking up for any reason other than, yeah, this saw really does work. Yeah. And then I just it gained enough momentum that all of a sudden people said, well, the one thing about this Cosmo saw is you can be brand new and cut a really good dovetail. Yeah. And that was the truth. So wow. that led into the whole development of uh, other, I call them age related tools. Our average customer is 65 years old. Nobody ever looked at that and said, how is he going to any? How is he any different than the original, the original the person that this saw was designed for in 1830? Lee Nelson makes a saw that they say is a copy of one made in Sheffield, England, in 1830. Okay, well, who bought a saw in 1830? I'll tell you, <laughs> teenagers. Yeah. yeah, teenagers going into an apprentice program. There were no 65 year old hobbyists. Kidding yeah. me? Life expectancy was 39. Yeah, they were in the ground. Nobody was paying attention to this. Interesting. So I stepped into it, and uh, I'll show you another little example. If you try to adjust, if you try to adjust the adjustment knob on a plane, and that adjustment knob is under the pressure of the lever cap, and it's hard to turn, really hard to turn. Like I said, if you have arthritis in your hand, it is it is impossible to turn. Well, I got this idea, and Jake and I, my son, worked on it. And we came up with what we call the adjust star. Uh -huh. It replaces the round wheel, and it's a five spoke. Yes. Oh my goodness! It, this this was uh, this was. Oh, I'll sum it up this way: I get emails from eighty year old guys who say, "Rob, I haven't been able to use my plane in twenty years, and now wow. I can." Thank you. Oh. And I think, why didn't somebody figure this out sooner? Yeah. You got all that all that leverage by pushing on the spoke instead of trying to squeeze this wheel. Yeah. So we just keep doing stuff like that, looking at tools or just looking at what I use myself and saying, what have I done? How have I modified this to make it more user friendly for this market? And yeah. Well, that point will this that even might lead us to the Purple Heart project, but that reminds me, you know, nobody or I should say very few people are thinking about how do you make life easier for the 80-year-old men in the world, <laughs> you know? Uh, those those are not like oh, high right on right? the Yeah, it's not high on the list of like people who's problems we're worried about solving so uh amazing that you, that you did it for them and um so maybe we let's move to the purple heart project because i think i have a pretty good idea now your qualifications to teach and have classes and all that so how did that side of this all come about okay so this is a long story that i'll try to uh compress. Oh, take your time yeah there's there's we're not in a hurry um five years ago i did everything i built the tools i procured the material I packaged the tools, I processed the order, I took them to the post office. We used to do five orders a day. Now we do 50 to 100. So a lot more people involved now. But back then, I was answering the emails. And as soon as you put your stuff out there, I always 
posted my phone, my own phone number and my email. I was the guy. And uh, I used to get emails all the time, people having questions. And I got this email, came in in March of 2016. This young man said, uh, Mr. Cosman, I can tell he's young when he calls him Mr. Cosman. Yeah. <laughs> he said, I've been doing some research, and I think you have the best dovetail saw. But I can't afford a new one. Do you ever have any with cosmetic flaws that you would sell at a discount? And if you do and would let me know, I, would, uh, I, I think I could save the money and get it. And you even said, uh, he says, if you totally ignore this, I understand. And in closing, he said, I'm a combat wounded Marine. Um, ever since I got involved in hand tool woodwork, it's the first time I found any peace from the physical and the mental pain I suffer from. Well, that just kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. I have no military background, but I started teaching this class I told you about called Training the Hand back in 2000. And my average student coming in would have been in his early 50s, typically a business executive. Um, I remember thinking, I, I never taught it at home. I always taught it either in Ontario, in Seattle, or in, in uh, Calgary. So I was away from home. And I remember thinking, boy, if I don't keep these guys busy, they'll be out drinking at night, and I won't even be able to find them the next morning. So I said, I'll fix them. So we'd get in the, sh in the shop at quarter to seven in the morning, and we'd stay till 11 o'clock at night or later. I always wanted to give, I always felt I needed to give them their money's worth. I used to yeah. worry that I wasn't charging enough, so I got to make up for it by giving them lots of extra. <laughs> and I wanted to do it, so I figured they wanted to do it. And I was right. <laughs> anyway, so my typical student, mid 50s, business executive, this is back in the age of Blackberries. He'd show up, and about every hour or so, he'd be running outside the shop trying to get better reception because the office wouldn't leave him alone harassing them. They'd, show, they'd be tight as a drum from stress. You could just see it in them. Mm -hmm. By Wednesday, they'd leave the phone at the hotel and you just watch this balloon deflate. And they came in as drums and they left as jellyfish. Mm -hmm. I would be telling them Friday night at midnight, you have to leave. This is <laughs> go over. Home. You have to go home. <laughs> they quit shaving. <laughs> they don't they comb their hair. They yeah. were just, the word chill doesn't even do it. Yeah. I thought it was funny. Yeah. I said, wow, what is it about this? It just takes these people who are candidates for a heart attack on Monday yeah. and turns them into, uh, wow, happy-go-lucky on Friday. Yeah. But when Jesse is the name of this combat wounded Marine, he said that, I just thought, wow, maybe this is something we should be doing for these guys. When I say these guys, I, uh, I, was, just, I was referring to uh, – that's to deal with PTSD and things like that. So um, another person had stepped into my life a year before. I, to this day, I've never met him. I've never spoken to him. I've only ever communicated through email. I got an email one day a year before. This man says, Rob, I really like what you're doing. I sent you $1,500. If you want, just why don't you do a draw every once in a while in your online workshop and give some tools away. He said, I'll pay full retail and I'll cover the shipping. How often do you get, how often do you get something like that? Amazing. Well, the check actually cleared the mail. Yeah. It cleared the bank. And I remember thinking, okay, now how am I going to pick out people to give tools to? I was thinking, well, maybe a veteran. I, uh, we ended up just uh, every, every week we would have a draw and we'd give away two or three prizes worth three or $400 worth of tools. And we did that for a year. This, this man gave me over $30,000 that first year. And again, to this day, I've never talked to him. I've never seen him. And we've only ever communicated by email. He wants to remain completely anonymous. What? The money just kept coming. Wow. Well, when this thing came with Jesse, I fired off an email. We call him Santa Claus, by the way. I said, <laughs> Santa, I said, we've helped a lot of people. Here's a guy that really deserves it. Yeah. And within the hour... He uh, contacted me back and he said, Rob, he said, you get a hold of Jesse and you tell him he's coming to Canada for a week. I've got this covered. So <laughs> I think back now it was funny because uh, here's this poor Jesse who's living in Southern California. I think he was living on $1,200 a month uh, money. The, the sad thing is, as beat up as these guys are, they have to keep fighting for their benefits. Huh. And they'll give it to them for a certain amount of time. And then they challenge them constantly. And you know what? They had enough fighting. They're done. Yeah. So a lot of them just say, it's not worth it. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Uh, Jesse was living on the street at times. It was terrible. Anyway, so Jesse looking for a discount on a saw 
I, I'd call him up and said, Hey, Jesse, you're coming to Canada. I got your plane ticket. I got to arrange your plane ticket and all this stuff, whatever. So he emails me back and he says, Mr. Cosby says, would you contact my family? He says, cause none of them believe me. <laughs> so anyway, um, that started the ball rolling. Uh-huh. Uh, we did everything we could for Jesse. Unfortunately, because of some things we didn't know about, we got him as far as the border in Niagara Falls where we were teaching. Couldn't get him across the border. What a nightmare. Oh no. But, um, I was right in the middle of, it was Monday morning. He was supposed to have come in on the weekend. Luther, who now works with me, retired Colonel U.S. Army, had gone, had come to take two classes back to back. Jesse was going to come in for the second class. Um, Luther was going to be there on the weekend. I had forgotten my passport, so I couldn't go over to the Buffalo airport to pick up Jesse. I said to Luther, I said, would you mind? He goes, absolutely, I'd do it. He went over, met Jesse, got him as far as the, uh, uh, customs where he was, he was refused entry and had to take him back to the hotel and we arranged the plane to, plane to send him home the next yeah. day. But it was a, it was a disaster. Yeah. So Monday morning, um, I'm sitting there trying to explain this to the class and I wasn't holding it together too well. And um, I'll get through it. Uh, Tony Martin, who would come in from Australia to take the class, came up and put his arm around me and said, Rob, you let me take care of this. So he raised enough money in the class to uh, buy a pay for, uh, buy a Schoberg workbench for Jesse and, and uh, well, we sent him seven or $8,000 worth of tools. Oh shipped it gosh. all down to his little apartment down in Southern California. And huh. At some point, Jesse said to me, he said, you don't know how you're reaching out to save my life. And I, uh, I just remember thinking some tools, a little bit of woodworking, it's going to make that much of a difference in someone's life. So uh, at somewhere, somewhere in there, I just knew that this is what I'm, I have to use the talent that I've been blessed with to do this. So, this gets better, by the way. Uh, we decided, I say we, Jake and I, my son, decided that uh, the next time we taught a class, which was going to be in November of 2016, instead of just having um, 12 paying customers, we would save six spots for combat wounded vets that we'd bring them in. And uh, we put it out on social media. We didn't have any other way of doing it. We had seven apply, seven Americans. I said, well, we're not going to leave one out. So we brought in all seven. Had this guy that used to take my classes everywhere I was. Great guy. His name was Bob Lippick. Bob was very wealthy, owned a, uh, an underground mining equipment company in Ontario. And he had died uh, from a heart attack just, uh, just a week or so before the class in 2014. 15, sorry. And somehow his wife, Barb, found out about what we were planning on doing. And she wrote me a check for $20,000. And she said, this is what Bob would want you to do. So we brought in uh, seven combat wounded vets, some of which I still maintain contact with. And uh, I had no idea what to expect. I remember telling Jake, I said, don't turn your back on them. I have no idea what we're in for. I didn't know anything about combat wounded vets <laughs> yeah. other than the crap that you see on the news, which is yeah. mostly crap. And uh, that week was a real... Uh, if you're lucky enough to have a defining moment in your life when you find out who you are and why you're here and what your purpose is, hmm. I had it. So we took the uh, we took it from there, and uh, Woodcraft stepped up to the plate to help me. We got a name for it. We called it the Purple Heart Project. Luther, who had taken a class I was teaching in Seattle, 
uh, ended up coming to that class. And at some point, he'd said to me that he, he was retired early because the Army kicks you out after so many years of service as a colonel. And he made the fatal mistake of saying, I need something to do. And I said, well, I got something for you. So he has stepped up to the plate in a way that I could never, I could never explain. Um, the Purple Heart Project is what it is today because of him. My business is what it is today because of him. He works tirelessly. He, uh, he, his heart is in the right spot. He does this because he knows that these people deserve it. Uh, Super Dave Benson, who's one of the combat wounded vets that came to an early class. His story is another phenomenal one that if you at some time we do this again, I'll tell you that because it was just mm. the way the pieces of the puzzle came. You see, if you decide to do the right thing, then what God does is he starts bringing these people into your life that otherwise you would never have met. Yeah. And they just started appearing. Like, What are the odds that some guy's going to send me money in the mail? Yeah. What are the odds that uh, Luther's going to come to my class and, and Super Dave? And uh, Bob Lippick and all these, all of these pieces of the puzzle fit as long as I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. You know, you do everything you can and then let, he'll handle the rest. Yeah. He'll open the doors that you can't open. And uh, I always tell people, it doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not. That doesn't change the reality. <laughs> it's just that's yeah. something you've got to wrestle with. Um, well, oh, sorry, go ahead. His hand has been involved in, uh, in so much of this. We find men that literally are attempting suicide in the morning and we call them in the afternoon to tell them they've been invited to our class. I can't tell you how many times that has happened. Mm -hmm. That is not coincidence. Uh, just unreal. Now I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm the first one to admit, I don't have any background in this. I teach woodworking. I can do it. I can teach it. Something about, I always tell people, remember who was a carpenter. Wood is good. That's what it says in the back of my shirt. Something about the camaraderie of being around uh, other people like-minded. Something about this material, working with it. Something about showing a little bit of compassion and generosity. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's skill building. It's all-encompassing. You teach somebody to cut a dovetail. You can't carry on a conversation while you're doing it. Yeah. It pulls in all of your faculties and you're focused. We, uh, we send every vet that we bring in, come to the class. We send them home with a, uh, somewhere around $4,000 worth of premium hand tools, just the kind that are on my bench. Wow. We have an organization now called the Bench Brigade, headed up by uh, Jack Lane down in Texas and Chris Chahusky. And they, they find civilian volunteers who agree to build, procure the materials and build a bench to our spec. Jack arranges it so that they can deliver it personally to a vet that lives near them that has come to our class. Oh, so they, so they can start at home and a, wow, geez, genius. Gets a bench so they can go home and this becomes their medicine shop. They yep. can set it up in a spare bedroom yeah. and, um, you know, they got a bad spell coming on. This is all coming from them. They can go out in that shop and in 10 minutes they're in a different world and then the clock stops yeah. and it just clears their mind. And what more can I tell you? That's, that is the Purple Heart Project. We've had, 13 classes to date. COVID interrupted us. We lost all of our 2020 classes and all but one 2021. But uh, the minute we're given the okay, we're full steam ahead. We've had a total of 95 combat wounded vets, three of whom were females. We've had one from Australia. We've had uh, seven and four, 11 from Canada and the rest, 83 Americans. Hmm. Don't care where they come from. We try to, uh, they apply online on our website and we try to treat it like triage, try to figure out who needs it the most. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do a live YouTube workshop every second Saturday night. I make myself available to answer questions and we give away prizes. Santa Claus pays for the prizes, still involved oh. heavily. And uh, we take donations and that pretty much finances the uh, whole thing. Uh, our, we set a record on July 31st, which happened to be my 60th birthday. And I just looked at the camera and I said, you know what? If you like what we've done for you, if you enjoy this, I want so I want a present. I want you to make a donation to the Purple Heart Project. And that night we raised over $20,000. Gosh, which paid for a whole class, you know, of yeah. guys so whose lives uh, will be changed. Wow. That's what we do. Wow. So... 
I got a bunch of thoughts. The first of which, just to uh, echo what you said, there, working with your hands and building things, um, or I should say the opposite of building things, which is doing nothing and having an empty, idle mind is is hard for me. And I was not, I haven't been traumatized in combat. <laughs> I can't imagine the the pain of a guy sitting at home, you know, without like a job or a family or a hobby that, that absorbs them enough. And so I, I, it makes sense to me why woodworking truly would be just good medicine for somebody like interrupt? this. Yeah. I need to share this with you because Luther taught it to me. I, I'm trying to understand this. So this is a terrible image to have to hold in your head, but these guys have to deal with it. So you, the public needs to know. You uh, you may encounter a bad guy who has a woman holding a baby and he's behind her and you come around the corner with your squad and he starts picking off your squad members because he knows that that civilized person is going to momentarily pause before they return fire knowing they're going to kill an innocent woman and child. Mm -hmm. But they have to. Because every split second that they wait, another one of their guys is getting picked off. Mm. Now, we're not designed to kill one another, even though in, in battle you don't have a choice. At some point in their life, they have to process what they did. It might yeah. happen right then. Yeah. Usually in the heat of battle, it gets compartmentalized and they don't deal with it for years later. We, we have Vietnam vets that come to us 50 plus years on, and it sometimes is like it was yesterday. Yeah. So you're at home. Uh, you've been traumatized without realizing it. You suffer from what's called uh, hypervigilance. So pretty hard to go from a combat zone where behind every tree or rock somebody's trying to shoot you to feeling normal in a mall or in a movie theater. So they choose just to stay at home. It's safer. It's more yes. comfortable. And you're sitting there with nothing to do. And this stuff just keeps playing over and over in your mind what you've done. Yeah. And I am convinced it's a, it comes from guilt. Yeah. Displace guilt, but guilt nonetheless. Yeah, well, they, they turn it into guilt. They they can't explain it any other way. If I wouldn't have hesitated, then this close friend of mine would be alive, let alone the woman and child, you know, in that scenario. Um, I think about, I can replay th things I did when I was a kid that were dumb and embarrassing, and I, and I just, like, still think about it from time to time. <laughs> I can't, it's hard to imagine uh, having to replay events like, like what these guys have seen. So what about for... For guys who are not, for example, I could imagine someone in their family might have a nephew who's in the situation. In other words, the vet's probably not like out digging. How could I improve my life? Is it how, how can families nominate or like oh well that's persuade that's, that's, someone to get into your program? Because that might be you're, you're telling why, me that's, that's why like I agreed to do this because this is the only way we find them. They are not. They are not looking. They're not out there trying to find some program. We find them because a mother, a brother, a sister, a cousin, finds out about this, knows them, and somehow the connection is made and we get them to apply. One of the hardest things is getting them to apply because we don't know them. So they have to be willing to put on paper their experience. And this is tough. Uh, they don't want to relive that. A lot of them just can't do it. They just they cannot do that. We don't advertise this, but I tell them, I said, you know what? You've got to talk to us like you would talk to your therapist. You're not going to exaggerate. And you're not going to hold back because unfortunately we have X number of applications to go through and we can only go by what we read on the paper. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard for them to do that. And uh, the other thing that's tough is once we accept them, Dave and Luther take care of Dave takes care of the first three classes. We do six classes a year in normal times can't do classes in the middle of Jan January in Canada because the snow and ice, nobody ever get to fly in. So we go a uh, May, June, July, and then August, September, October. Dave takes care of the first three. Luther takes care of the last three. And it's, it's a battle to keep these guys engaged. They start getting this, uh, this uh, survivor's guilt or being chosen guilt. Mm. Somebody else deserves it more than me. Mm. And I try to tell him, I said, look, you come, let us help you, and then you can turn around and help as many as you want. And there's lots of them that uh, go out, and we get referrals from guys who have been to the class, had it do something for them. And the first thing we think about is, I know five other guys that need to be here, and that's mm. another way. So the more people that know about it, the better chance we stand of finding the ones that really need it. Wow. 
Um, uh, back to about woodworking a little bit. I, when I think of hand tool woodworking, I automatically associate it with high end, complex, not beginner uh, type of woodworking. And I could imagine some, let's just say vets, but anybody who kind of wants to get into woodworking um, feeling that way. So how, how accessible is this type of woodworking to people with you know limited shop skills and experience? Let me just grab something that I can show you. So okay. just a box, right? That wide, that tall, that long as a sliding lid. Well, it's not terribly complicated. It's got half line dovetails on this end. It's got through dovetails, half line on that end as well. But this started off as a rough board as it came from the, uh, from the lumber mill. So the first thing they have to do is get that board, cut it to length, rough length, meaning you're gonna cut a piece about that long, quarter inch longer than what you want finished. You need that board to sit nice and flat so it doesn't rock around. Well, if it rocks around while you're trying to plane one side, then part of it's just bending under the weight of the plane and bouncing back up. The first thing you do is use your scrub plane to get it to sit flat. And then you gotta go through and you gotta make one surface flat out of wind or twist. Flat, smooth, finished. And that's what you're going to reference everything else off of. So when you do it step at a time, it's not hard. If you stand back and look without realizing that, okay, we're just going to break this down into 20 steps. And each step is easy to do. Complete it, go to the next step. Then you do an edge. Then you do an op opposite edge that's parallel to that edge. And then you do an end that's square in both directions. And then you do the opposite end. Now you've got your board to length, to width. And you're going to take a marking gauge and you're going to score from your reference face the thickness that you want the board to be. And you're going to make them line all the way around. And you just plane down to that line. Well, now you have this piece. Well, if you can make this piece, you can make that piece. Mm -hmm. And then you make this piece. Actually, what we do is we put two, these two together, process one piece, cut it in half. So now you've got your four pieces. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to teach them how to cut a dovetail. If you have good tools, you just have to learn how to operate the tool. If I can teach 87-year-olds how to cut dovetails, anybody can do it if you have the right tool. And then the rest of the pieces are just essentially what you've already done. So they make this neat little candle box with dovetails all the way around. Yeah. So most pieces of furniture are nothing but a bunch of rectangles put together in some fashion to uh, become a functional piece of furniture. Right. It's all about taking the end product and breaking it down to the smallest possible step. So instead of looking at 5,000 processes as one, you look at that one process and think, can I do that? Sure, I can do that. Huh. And uh, you build their confidence. Most important is you teach them that you cannot proceed to step two until step one has been done as accurately as the unaided hand and eye can tell. Uh -huh. teach them this if you allow a little bit of error here and here and here and here then it's not going to work yeah and that's that's that is almost a character trait every once in a while we get somebody that thinks that as long as both ends of the board are in the same room it fits <laughs> that's not the case yeah that's me <laughs> those are people <laughs> Yeah, I won't say anymore. <laughs> no, I, I, I accept it. So it's no, no problem. What, what I found with the vets is that uh, I didn't expect much. Wow, was I wrong? I yeah. saw. I have seen the best dovetails ever. Huh. We had a guy named Phil Gustafson, and uh, Phil was in the very first class I taught. And I typically on dovetail day, I, I present it, and uh, they can't proceed until they've actually made six cuts on the end of the tailboard that are all accurate. Uh -huh. And it takes the average guy 10, 12 tries. Huh. Well, 15 minutes into it, Phil says, okay, Rob, I'm done. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, right. And I went down, I looked at it, and I said, oh, my goodness, this guy's actually, they were perfect. They were perfect. I said, now, what am I going to do with him? <laughs> Teach well, <a> class. <laughs> fortunately, he cut on the wrong side of the line, had to start over. <laughs> But I have his dovetail up behind me. It's this one right here. You can't see because it's up high. But yeah, and, I, and Phil actually is a big contributor. He now donates every month. He was the first one. Wow. He donates every month to the Purple Heart Project. And wow, what a success story that is! I can't even tell you that one because I can't get through it. But 
that's that that one that one alone would just make you say holy smokes so people who are who want to be involved or know someone the place to go is your website to that's where the application happens that's where it looks like most of your video content is kind of uh, collected there is that correct robcosman.com as soon as you pull up the page on the top on the top bar on the left hand side big purple banner purple heart project and luther has <coughs> luther has built that and he's got uh, uh before and after pictures from the guys in their battle rattle their army clothes to mm. them today and everything possible in there the application form testimonials the whole bit everything you need uh, that's perfect yeah. hey one more question for you and this is i should have put this before we got into the purple heart project but i it's hard for men in with their career you know when you look back it kind of makes sense you can see these steps like with your career now you have this really probably satisfying business and doing a lot of good but i'm sure there was a lot of moments where you could, you didn't know exactly what was coming next. And I, I know my career has felt like that a lot. Do you got anything to sh- say about that? Because separate from the vets, even just everyone with, with kids, you know, that pressure of, of making a living and, and planning out what should I do? I don't know. I got all these options or maybe I only have one or two options. And uh, what's that like? You're 60 now looking back and you could probably say, like, hey, all that stress kind of worked out OK up at this point, at least. Or what? what do you say to guys when you see them with that kind of look in their eye a little bit stressed about their career and small kids and all that that's where i am well the first part i uh i remember it well five children 75 dollars to my name and i just remember and uh you know a life up to that point of wanting to be the best woodworker that could possibly be and coming to the realization that uh okay this isn't working yeah and uh, what am I going to do? And uh, I didn't give up. I tried everything. You mean I? Uh, you just keep throwing stuff at the wall until something finally sticks. And uh, you know what? I mean, I went out and I tried to sell the magazines. I sold. I sold skincare to men. <laughs> I recruited men to sell skincare. Yeah. And my wife and I were we won the top sales awards for Canada months in a row. Huh. And I think back now, I said, oh, my goodness. I went out and I approached men, not only to sell them skincare, but get them to sell skincare. And I just, so I learned to sell. Yeah, yeah, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> I learned to, uh, I wouldn't wear a graduation ring. They're the ugliest things I've ever seen in my life. And here I was out selling them. So I learned <laughs> to sell. Yeah. That had to be, that was in the kit. Um, I, I learned to persevere and just push through and, you know what? Sooner or later, something has to happen. Yeah, and uh, and it did. So you're only done when you quit. Yeah. So, but now I can look back and say that um, there's a book called um, "Think and Grow Rich" by Napoleon Hill. And uh, what it boils down to is, you can do anything you decide you can do. And people who who that so easily and so readily, but it's true. I've proved it in my own life. Hmm. My wife is the one that, uh, that beat that into me, but I'm glad she did because I finally came to realize that it's just a matter of deciding this is what I'm going to do. And then somehow the stars all line up, but you have hmm. to be committed. It can't be wishy-washy. It's like, uh, when we did the purple heart project, I told Jake, I said, I don't care if we have to pay for this ourselves. We're not going to yeah. wait for the money. We do it. We plan it. We do it. The means will follow. Yeah. And it's the same with running a business. You have to plan it and do it, and things will fall into place. If you're living, if you're trying to live righteously, you promise that uh, God will pick up where you can't, or do what you can't. Dale Nish did it for me. He said, he said, I'll open the doors, but you've got to walk through. Mm-hmm. Which means... I'll do the part you can't, but you've got to be willing to do the work. And I proved to him over the time that there was no uh, amount of work that I wouldn't do. So when I first landed at BYU, I was digging holes. I was digging, using a shovel, hooking up, um, uh, you know, the stuff when you go and do foundations, whatever. Because yeah. I knew a guy that had a contracting business and he needed somebody to operate a shovel. I wasn't proud. proud. <laughs> yeah. I did it. Yeah. So you, you got to be willing to, but it's not just hard work. It's not just hard work. 
So I would tell anybody that's uh, wanting to get ahead, read Think and Grow Rich. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, I, I'm not going to forget that moment where you explained the realization that there's more people interested in doing the fine woodworking than purchasing the fine woodworking. Just as an example of like little moments where your your thoughts can kind of just change, where all of your hard work and skill building doing fine woodworking was super relevant and going to pay off, just not in the exact way that you kind of imagined a couple weeks before that. and Again, now looking back, it's like, geez, I, I'm really good at teaching woodworking. And thankfully, you know, that realization came. So I guess the point is, and I've seen this in my life where, I don't know, small things can change just in perspective or in meeting a particular person or in, you know, whatever piece of technology or who knows what that can completely change the game. So for for anyone, anyone really feeling stressed by this, I think sticking with it and keeping your chin up and probably that book is a great uh, yeah. toolkit also to help them get there huh yeah you have to pray too you have to be willing to ask and you have to be very specific ask exactly for what you want for what you're looking for and then be ready to accept it and show gratitude always show gratitude make a list every day of 10 things you're grateful for write it on paper and you'd yeah. be surprised how that will change your outlook and uh yeah there's this is open to anybody there isn't anybody that is disadvantaged you're only disadvantaged yeah. by yourself you do all your own disadvantaging Anybody can do it if they're willing to put their mind to it and put in the effort. That's amazing. Well, hey, can't thank you enough. And I should just emphasize your your woodworking classes are also available for non combat wounded vets, right? You do these clinics and and there's seats for other people who would want to come. Or has that kind of I, I need a changed? minute to explain that. Okay. And remember, I said I have no idea what I'm doing. So everything <laughs> I know, I've, I've I've observed. So we always have six, uh, we actually do a class of 14 now. So we always have seven civilians in the class. And the civilians are the integral, critical part of the process. Because what I didn't realize was these combat wound vets don't like civilians. They don't want to be around them. Hmm. We ask dumb questions, <laughs> really dumb questions. And rather than deal with that, they just hmm. avoid it. Interesting. I plunk these seven combat wounded vets who don't know each other in a room with seven strangers. Well, the vets have an instant brotherhood. The seven civilians are on the other side of the room like deer in the headlights. They're there for the right reason, but they don't know what to say or do. Yeah. But what happens is, and this is the part that is so, so healing. Um, I start right off. I, I'm a taskmaster. I'm going to make you be your very best. It has nothing to do with the guy beside you, but you're going to be as good as you can be, meaning you can no longer, you will no longer be able to see with the unaided hand or eye how you can improve. And I will push you to that point. So this stuff is hard to do. So what happens is everybody's working away. You've been struggling with something for three hours. You finally figure it out. You look over your shoulder and this guy over there that you don't know is where you were an hour ago. Well, the natural inclination is to go over and say, hey, I, this is what I did. Hmm. So these, seven stra these 14 strangers by day two have uh, all started to gel. So for the first time, these vets are actually dealing with these civilians and not seeing them as civilians. They're just friends, common interest, working together. And uh, everybody in the class gets an opportunity to stand up and introduce themselves. And that's there's no format to that. It's just, who are you? Where'd you come from? How'd you get involved in woodworking? Whatever else. It's The vets usually don't do that until the third or fourth day. We'll do two or three every time we take a break. I get four or five in a day. And... Uh, so when the vets finally get stand up to say that, they're now comfortable, usually comfortable for, in a group of people for the first time since they left the service. And a lot of times the uh, floodgates break open. Yeah. And all this pent up stuff all of a sudden comes washing out and there's not a dry eye in the room, but uh, wow, it's healing for them. It's like they've taken this rucksack off their back and they can now breathe easier Hmm. And it's the civilians who make friends with these guys and nobody's trying to do anything. They're just there and it all just kind of happens. It just flows. So the civilians are a huge part of the success of this program. They make friends and stay in contact. And it's just, it really is a, it, uh, it's a pretty magical occurrence. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame that I can't get anybody from the military to come down for an hour just to watch, just to <laughs> see what's going on. Yeah, well, you never know. Things change quick, and and uh, we'll see. I, it, it'll be exciting to see how this grows and what it turns into, you know, 
uh, in the future because it's, it's doing a lot of good. Well, hey, can't thank you enough, Rob, for taking the time. I'm going to link to this, of course, in the description. And we'll, uh, you're on YouTube also. The audience should know all these videos. And all, all, they can see a lot of this with their own eyes on YouTube. you got actually a pretty serious amount of content out there. So, um, RobCosman.com is the name of the channel. Yeah, robcosman.com. All right, Rob, well, keep it up. It's amazing uh, what you're taking what you're doing for these guys and uh, can't wait to can't wait to stay um, in the loop and keep an eye on it. So, thanks again. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to do it and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to talk about it.